are called to bless people and we celebrate what God is doing in us and through us, stories like that. God blesses us to be a blessing and life's exciting when you wake up every day thinking, who can I bless? God, what are you gonna do today? God, what do you wanna do today? And that acronym BLESS, begin with prayer. That's a great place to start. And then listen, listen to people. Listen well, like you really care. Listen with love and listen sincerely. Eat together, have a meal, a coffee, serve people. So many needs around us every day. And then share, share about your faith, share about your story, share some encouragement with someone. And when you bless someone, you're faithful to do that, God can take care of all the results. Just waking up, ready to bless someone. That's how we wanna live. That's our culture, that's our calling. And you can do it anywhere you go, where you live, work, learn, or play. It could be, if you're a driver, you really have an advantage because the other person can't go anywhere, right? I mean, like, that's a great story. You just start sharing and where are they gonna go? Uh, I'm having some fun with it, but you should have some fun with it. Be creative, enjoy loving people, blessing people. That's where God is moving and we love to hear the stories of what you're doing during the week. We also uh, celebrate that we have Christmas in July, meaning we wanna give gifts in July to our international partners. We have over 40 international partners. We're doing ministry together, life together. Over half of them are raised up from our church. We're a sending church as well. And Christmas in July, we put gifts out there in the lobby and you picked up all the gifts so quickly. They're gone, they're gone. All the gifts are going to international partners now. Thank you for your generosity. It just shows, like, you're so eager to bless people. You're so eager, like, what else can we do? And I love it that our international partners are gonna get some encouragement, not at Christmas in December, but Christmas in July. Today, we're Psalm 92 in the scripture as we go through the Psalms together. Psalms are hymns, songs, prayers, deep expressions to God, crying out to God. Psalm 92 you can turn there in your Bible. Let us know if you need a Bible. On your phone, just go to Psalm 92. And today's theme is flourishing, flourishing with God. Would you say today that you are flourishing with God? And how do you flourish with God? Let's dive in to scripture together. Father, thank you for your goodness to us, that you are faithful, that you are kind, that you are patient. You provide God, you protect us, and we give you praise today. God, right now in this moment, we wanna trust you. We wanna come with faith, seeking your face. And God, applying and exercising our faith in the many situations in our lives. There's probably some situations where we feel overwhelmed or intimidated, we're a little scared if we're honest. Maybe we're not walking by faith. And God, we pray in those situations today, we would choose faith, we would choose to trust you, we would trust your word, we would trust your guidance Empowered through the Holy Spirit as we surrender and rely on you together. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. How can you flourish during the difficult seasons of life? This word flourish in Psalm 92, it means a couple of different things. It means that you're growing, blooming. For those of you who like flowers and gardens, you get a picture of blooming, soaring like an eagle. And how do you step into these images and pictures spiritually in your relationship with God? Breaking forth, soaring, blooming, growing, that's the picture of flourishing. And the first starting point today is to know that you can flourish. You can flourish in every season, every age and stage of life, you can flourish. You say, well, why, how do I know that? Because God's hope is greater than our challenges. And God's hope is available to every one of us today. God's hope is available. God's hope is relational. This is a relationship where you're abiding. It's not just self-effort. It's not self-sufficiency. This is a relationship where you're abiding. And also his hope is habitual. We're gonna really take a closer look today at what are your choices and what are you cultivating? Because your choices and what you cultivate in your life is directly linked to flourishing with God. And we see this in Psalm 92 laid out clearly, and it's helpful when it's laid out clearly as we look at God's word and what God is communicating to us today. Psalm 92, starting in verse one, and you'll see that there's notes at the top, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. 
to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. The first truth is to be intentional with the vibrant rhythms of your spiritual life. Your spiritual life is not just dry, go through the motions, another principle. No, there's a vibrancy and there's also a rhythm in our spiritual life and in our walk with God. When you open up the Bible, start observing. What do you see? What do you notice? What do you pay attention to? You see at the top there, Sabbath. Here's one observation. The Sabbath is part of a rhythm in your spiritual life. A Sabbath is a design time by God where you're gonna be refreshed, you're gonna reconnect with God, you're gonna get refueled for the next six days that are coming up, a Sabbath time. Now, it takes a commitment to have a Sabbath. If you have no commitment around resting, you won't rest in this culture. This culture will drive you and drive you and take more and demand more. It sounds kind of ironic that you need to be committed to resting, because <laughs> resting sounds so easy and commitment sounds like you really gotta be serious. You've gotta be committed to resting, committed to reconnecting with God, committed to receiving from God and being refreshed. And when you get close to God, you're also gonna reconnect with other people because the two come together. You've gotta be committed to that rest. I don't know if you're committed or not. You might be someone who just runs seven days a week and there's just, your phone's always on. There's always more work. There's always things you could do. The to-do list, if you are running and running and running, you might be running in a rhythm that's not coming from the Holy Spirit. So the Sabbath, commitment. Commitment, like going to church. The Bible talks about the first day of the week and the things that happen as we gather together. That's a commitment. Uh, some of you are here every single week and sometimes in the same chairs, let's be honest. It, and it might be nice if someone sits in your chair, just be kind, don't be rude, don't say that's my chair. But some of you have this routine, and it's a noble routine, but it's just a commitment. Everyone in your family knows, all right, we're going to church, we're going to worship, we're going to draw near to God. That's a great rhythm, that's a great commitment. If you don't have that commitment, you're gonna wake up in the morning and say, like, I don't know, what do you feel like? I don't know how the weather outside. Well, have you seen which game's on yet? You know, you're just gonna go through that list of things Commitment to rest, commitment to worship. There's a commitment with the Sabbath that's good for the soul. It's good for the soul. Families that worship together every week, come together and worship together, there's a rhythm that carries over into the rest of the week. It's just a really healthy rhythm for a family. And I love it at Grace, multi-generational. Sometimes we have grandparents, um, kids, and then their kids. We have three generations coming together to worship. What an amazing picture. And what a blessing that is when you come together as a family, you just know this is where we meet up, this is where we meet with God, we make space for God in our lives. So I encourage you to commit to resting, commit to worshiping, and commit together as a family. That's a rhythm that's gonna bless you for all your days. What else? We see praise and thanks. And the Bible says real clear here, it is good to praise the Lord. It's good to thank the Lord. There's not a lot of things in life where you can just say, it's always good. It's 100% good. It is always good to give thanks to God. It is always good to worship God. In every situation in life, it is always a good choice to give him thanks and to give him praise. And that choice right there, that good choice, you move from sentiment to expression. It's not just that I kinda just feel grateful. That's great to feel grateful, but you actually thank the one who's blessing you. It's not just that I, I appreciate God and he's worthy and I have that sentiment. That's a great place to start, but then it's expression. God, I give you praise. I don't just have a general thanksgiving. I'm expressing my faith, and we have a faith that we exercise and we express. We don't just internalize and think, okay, that's enough. No, it starts in the inside deep, but then it comes out in expression. In our words, God's given us a mouth to praise him, to thank him, and it's important to not hinder the rhythm and the flow. God, yes, we give him thanks because he's worthy, and then we express praise and thanks. Don't get it too congested in there, but instead, let your thanks and praise flow. It's good to thank and praise the Lord. You will never thank God and say, that was a mistake, bad choice. 
as I look back on my day, too much Thanksgiving. You know, I gotta worship him a little less during the day. You're just not going to. It's good to thank and praise the Lord. And then here's another one, morning and evening. As you observe, it says morning and evening. Well, what does that include? That means daily rhythm. This is daily abiding. In the morning, in the evening, it means at home. Because I look around and I love it that we're together on Sunday, but you're not here on Tuesday morning. And some of you aren't here on you know, Thursday night. And so, so what does that mean, morning and evening? That means where you spend the most time, at home. What does that mean? Some prayer at home. Well, what does that mean? Some scripture at home. Some spiritual food at home. Morning and evening, I'm abiding with you. I'm close to you. And in that closeness, it includes some of those blessings, those rhythms of praying, of spending time listening to God in his word. And it's a picture of all during the week. Do you see how you can take a few verses that sound kind of nice and then realize they're tied to this rhythm, morning and evening, praising and thanking, a Sabbath. Say, well, are there other rhythms in our walk with God? Absolutely. Serving is a rhythm. During the day, the serving that you do, using your gifts and your talents and your opportunities. Well, what else? Giving is a rhythm. Generosity is a rhythm. It's intentional. What about fasting? I had a dad say that I'm on the 816 fasting plan. I fast for eight hours and then I eat for 16. (laughs) I'm pretty sure the eight hours he's talking about are the hours he's sleeping. Uh, But fasting, it's in the Bible. What's your rhythm with fasting? You know, as a church, we fast for three weeks in January. That's a great thing. But what about the other, you know, 49 weeks? Is there any fasting? So these rhythms, and here's the key. You just give the Holy Spirit access. You just give the Holy Spirit access. God, what does fasting look like in my life? God, what does it look like to walk with you in our home? God, I don't wanna hold back praise and thanksgiving. Lead and guide me, Holy Spirit. That's the key. And there's gonna be these rhythms, and once you have them, it's like a dance, it's like a symphony, it's a movement that's inspiring the Holy Spirit. It's a dynamic relationship. And in this, there's gonna be great joy. These different rhythms. And uh, when you read the Psalms, what you're gonna notice is that when you do these, others will also do these. When you choose these rhythms, you're gonna inspire other people. Because I think you know this, people are always watching you. They're always watching me. They're always watching you. They're always noticing. They're always observing. Oh, what are you choosing? Does that work? Like, what's going on there? Like, they're, they're always watching. And when you are making these choices to walk with God and spiritually and there's a rhythm, they're gonna see that and they're like, wow, you, you're dancing. You're light. Like, you've got some joy. You're flourishing like... What's the story underneath that? Because I'm just weighed down and kind of feeling isolated and stressed and you just seem like, I don't know, there's something different going on right there. And so people are gonna be watching and in the Psalms, one person will and then a community will. And then the community culture changes. And someone will, someone else will start to thank God, someone else will thank God, someone else in their home will start to be vibrant spiritually and someone else will say, what are you doing? Oh, well, we read the Bible together at night before we go to bed, then we pray, and then, oh, you do that? You can do that? Oh, at home? How do you do that? Where do you start? Well, I like the Psalms, and it just starts to grow. When you make these choices, other people wanna enter in with you, and in the Psalms, it's not just an individual thing, it's a community thing. And the culture of the community comes down to individual choices. Here's another piece in the Psalms. When you focus on your spiritual health, many other areas of your life become to get more healthy as well. Emotional health starts to improve when you focus on your spiritual health. Now, if you made your focus joy and peace, and you're just like, I gotta have more joy, I gotta have more peace, I gotta have more joy, I gotta have more peace, you're not gonna have that much joy and peace. But when you make your focus to seek and praise and thank God and to walk closely with Jesus, joy and peace are gonna increase in your life. That's what scripture says. You abide with Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit. The more you give the Holy Spirit permission, access, 
to take over in your life, the more joy and peace you're gonna have. So make your focus not joy and peace. Don't chase after joy and peace. Like I have a little more, a little more, a little more today. No, make your focus Jesus and abide with him and in a healthy relationship with Jesus, joy and peace are gonna be the fruit that come from that. You say, well, well, what else? The Psalms are really about personal experience. They're not so much a doctrinal statement. We need doctrinal statements. Please be solid doctrinally and biblically and theologically, yes. The emphasis in the Psalms is this personal relationship that's deep, that's intimate, and you experience with the living God. Why is that personal connection and experience and intimacy so important? It's important because that's where a lot of the excitement comes. That's where the owning your faith really comes. That's where passion starts to come. Now it's not just something I've heard about from someone else. It's not just something I was taught as a truth and a principle. It's actually something I can talk about in my own relationship with God that's deep and vibrant and flourishing. That's so important in your faith. You just can't take everything through your spouse or through your life group leader or through you know, who you watch online. Like, yes, we learn from each other. We're lifelong learners. But you've got to own your faith. And your relationship with God will be as good as you want it to be. You will be as close with God as you want to be. And it'll be as full and rich as you want it to be. No one else can demand that upon you. This is drink deeply. This is living water for thirsty souls. And you drink deeply this fount that doesn't run out. That's what we see in the Psalms. David writes so many of the Psalms. Psalm 52 he wrote, and look at verses eight and nine. But I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. For what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people, and I will hope in your name, for your name is good. This is what David learns when he seeks God, when he praises God, when he abides with God, it flows into every part of his life. You look at David and all the different roles he has, and you probably have a lot of different roles during the week. David abides with God, and then you see him as a shepherd, right? You see him taking care of sheep. He draws close to God, and then he serves the army and the military. He brings the bread and the cheese and the food and the snacks. He's walking close with God, listening with God, and then he takes down Goliath. He's abiding with Jesus. He's abiding with God. He's abiding, and what happens? They're attacked by many armies, Many times over, sometimes the same armies, the same people will oppose you, the same people undermine you. And he abides and there's victories in those battles. He abides and he plays his instrument to encourage people, especially King Saul, who's downcast. He abides and he writes down scripture. He writes new songs. He abides and he's a king that's making decisions to unite people and to lead people well and to steward what God has given to him. When David's not abiding, you see what happens, adultery. When David's not abiding, you see what happens, murder. When David's not abiding, he's a passive dad that should be way more involved, not leading well. When he's abiding, it's very different. When he's not abiding, it's very different. You can see the difference. And David, you say, why is David always writing, I praise the Lord, I thank the Lord, your unfailing love, in the morning, in the evening. Like, why is he always doing that? Because he knows that's the key to his entire life. It's not just, a, oh, let's give nod to God. <laughs> no, this is like what life is all about. I'm gonna abide with Jesus and then every role I step into, you're gonna see fruit because I'm gonna continue to abide. And oh, by the way, any of us like David, you stop abiding, you can do any sin any day in the worst way. Just stop abiding, just go down that road. Watch David's life. But when he's abiding, that's available to all of us. So we learn from David and what's key in our faith is there's God's presence and God's principles and we truly need both. God's presence is greater than God's principles. God's in it, 
in terms of his principles, his plan. But God's presence is greater than God's principles. The Pharisees had so many of God's principles, but they didn't have God's presence. Say that again. They, did they look to the scripture? Absolutely. And what did Jesus say? Yet you refuse to come to me. God's presence is greater than his principles. His principles should point you to his presence. He's in his principles. We need both. But God's presence is where we truly find life. And then we walk in his principles and precepts. Does that make sense from the Psalms? I'm, I'm kind of halfway through this series and I'm just trying to summarize some key things that we see reiterated here. Maybe some of you have been on vacation for a few weeks, you're coming back, you know, refreshed to the tan. It's like, get back into the Psalms. You've been at the beach, it's been great, family times. All oh, that's wonderful. And then we come back to the Psalms and it's like, yes, the life that is truly life is found in the presence of God. And you can dive in and experience his presence, glorify and enjoy him wherever you go, vacation, at home, at church. That's the heart of the Psalms. Now, I said that you can flourish in the most difficult situations. There's two situations, I think, that are highlighted in Psalm 92. You say, well, could I still flourish in these situations? So let's take a look at verse four. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. How profound your thoughts. The senseless man does not know, fools do not understand, that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will be forever destroyed. But you, O Lord, are exalted forever. For surely your enemies, O Lord, surely your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered. You have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured out upon me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the rout of my wicked foes. The truth is to remember and celebrate with other people the great works of the Lord. Please remember the Bible says over and over again, remember, 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 remember. It's just a continual word in the Bible. Remember, and as you remember, celebrate the great works that the Lord has done. Now, here's the difficulty for the psalmist. How can people who reject God appear to flourish, have so many great resources, have so many blessings, and it's important to not be envious, jealous, or start to covet what other people have. Sometimes you might be walking with God and think, well, how come I'm walking with God and I don't have A, B, C, D, or E, and then someone over here, they hate God, and they have A, B, C, and D, and it looks like they're gonna get E as well. It just doesn't compute. It doesn't make sense. What do you do with that tension? Well, there's some key words the psalmists use. First of all, those who reject God, senseless. They don't sense or perceive. Their perception is off spiritually. They don't pay attention to God. They will see the beauty in the Pacific Northwest and they won't realize there's a creator. There's intelligent design that God's presence and power all of the trees are pointing up to God. All these wonderful coniferous trees pointing up to God. They just, they don't see it. And they don't see the Lord and they don't see what's coming. They don't see the consequences for their choices. They don't see eternity. They don't see the future. They're just right now me in this moment and they don't see it. It's senseless. And then they make foolish choices. Their priorities are off. They're worldly priorities. They don't align with the word. Their ways, their thinking, they're sincere. They'll say it on the podcast, on the little clip you watch on social media. They'll say it's sincere, and some people will buy into it, but you hear it and think, wait a second, this is not God's way, God's truth, or God's word. You, you just think that's foolish what you're sharing with the world. And then evildoers, in their pride, they'll do things that are evil, selfishness, self-exalting, no respect from God, and ultimately enemies of God, opposed to God and opposed to God's will, opposed to God's truth in opposition of Jesus. That's what you see in the culture. And the psalmist notes that they spring up. They appear to be flourishing. They have positions, they have prestige, they have possessions, and they appear to have power. 
in their positions. They have power. They're looked up to. They have prestige. They have so many possessions. It just looks like their lives are flourishing from all the worldly standards. And yet the truth is going forward, they will perish. They will be scattered. This is short-lived. And ultimately, God and evil don't coexist. Coexist is a, an anthem for many people. Just let everything and everybody and every belief coexist. Well, in one sense, that's true because we're all on this earth together. There's one earth, so we're all coexisting. But when you try to say, oh yeah, God and sin coexist, just God and sin get along great? No, they don't. God will ultimately end all evil, and in heaven, there'll be no sin. God is gonna get rid of all evil. His vision of heaven is not to coexist with a bunch of sin. A holy God's only heaven, it's a place of perfection. And the only way all of us sinful, flawed humans could spend eternity with God is if a sinless savior who's human in God takes our place, the full wrath, gives us his righteousness and perfection. So now when God sees us, he doesn't call us sinners, he calls us saints. And we didn't earn it, that's our position by grace and faith through Jesus. When you open up the Bible, you're gonna see all these different people that appear to flourish. They have prestige, power, positions, but then you watch the rest of the story. Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the earth, 10 plagues later, you realize Pharaoh can't save himself and he's not greater than God. Jezebel was a woman who didn't walk in the ways of the Lord. She had a lot of influence and power, but then who she really is, it became more and more obvious, and the Lord took care of the rest of the story. Nebuchadnezzar, boasting about all his leadership and achievements and all he has. Look at me, look what I built. And then keep reading the rest of the story. Herod, full of himself, so full of himself, saw himself as God, was ready to receive worship from people. Acts chapter 12, verse 21, on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, feeling really good about himself, looks like he's flourishing in his own mind, sat on his throne, delivered a public address to the people, and they shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. And as he usually does, Herod was just treasured those compliments that everyone thinks he's God. Well, immediately on the appointed day, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. That's how quickly God can take someone who self-exalts, their life is over, eaten by worms, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Many people will oppose the word of God. The word of God will always keep flourishing but the person who opposes God's word will not always keep flourishing. They will be found out, and God is a God of justice and wrath, and those who want to oppose him are no match for him. And so as the psalmist looks out, are there people who reject God, who just appear to have you know, this, 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 and this? Yes, but pray for those people. Love those people. Don't be one of those people. Come back to God, come back to the Lord. In verse eight, there's a hinge. And as you read through the Bible, there's these turning points, these hinges, these contrasts. In verse eight, but you, O Lord, are exalted forever. As opposed to everyone who's trying to exalt themselves, but you, O Lord, that's emphatic, but you, O Lord, are exalted forever. God's presence, God's character, and God's actions. You cannot separate God's character and God's actions. You cannot compartmentalize. Oh, here's God's character, but, but then let's separate that from God's actions. God's character and God's actions are together always linked. God's actions reveal his character. There's consistency with his character in his actions. They are fully connected. And sometimes when you're thinking about God or even thinking about other people, you might say, oh, his character's awesome. 
oh yeah, but he does this, this, and this. No, no, no. If he does this, this, and this, that reveals his character. So you can't say, there's consistency with character and actions. Actions reveal character. When you think about God, he's inspiring. We're in awe and we worship because of his character and his actions. In Psalm 92, what's repeated seven times is the Lord. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. The focus is on God. In Psalm 92, this is a reminder for us. Remember, be God-centered. Don't be me-centered. Be God-centered. Now, when we focus on God, does he bless us? Oh, yes, he does. And what are the blessings here? We read about the horn, God's favor, God's strength. We read about the oil, God's joy, God's gladness. When you are God-centered, God's strength in your weakness. When you are God-centered, God's joy instead of a song of despair and defeat. God-centered and then we are blessed. But don't take those blessings and be blessing-centered. Don't take those blessings and be me-centered. In the Bible, we celebrate both. It's okay to celebrate both. You celebrate God and who he is and his character and what he's done, and you celebrate the blessings that you have. Just because you celebrate blessings doesn't mean you're me-centered. Some people get really nervous theologically if you celebrate a blessing. (laughs) No, it's good to celebrate a blessing. But remember the order. God-centered, and then God does bless us. Both are true. That's the sequence in the order. Primarily is God and centered on God, but also he blesses us. As you live that out, don't pull away from that and be blessing-centered or me-centered. Does that make sense? Okay, you're tracking with that. That's important because you're gonna see that played out a hundred times in the next week. Is someone me-centered or God-centered? And what does it look like with the blessings? What do we do with those? And the Psalms make it so clear. God is the one, again, we're in awe and in wonder in who God is, what he does. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12, a great chapter. If, if you're feeling like you, know, you wanna be inspired to worship God, Isaiah chapter 40 is another chapter. It's catalytic for us in worship. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Poetically describing God. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? And the implied answer here is no one. None of us draw close to God and say, God, can I teach you a few things? God, I think there's a few things you don't know. God, I was reading your word and you got some stuff wrong. God, why don't I counsel you? You know what, I'm gonna give you the family and friends rate, God. I'm just gonna counsel you, give you a couple of freebies just to help you kind of get established on some stuff. Do you see how easily we flip in our pride? Instead of God, I trust you. I know you have all wisdom. Your thoughts and ways are above mine. God, I'm here to trust you, follow you, and glorify you. To instead, like, well, I run my own life. Oh yeah, God, what'd you mention down there? Some of it's all right, but you know, I think I got the rest of it just fine, God. Why don't I just counsel you on what 2023 is like? Because I think this book is written a long time ago, and so, you know, you're clearly a little outdated. I'm gonna catch you up here, God. Do you see the pride in our culture today? And it comes right into the church. It doesn't stay outside the walls of church. It comes right into churches, denominations, Bible colleges. And instead of God creates us and we're made in his image, We are me-centered, and then we tell God who he is. We just flip the whole thing. Well, that's not what you see in the Psalms. When you see who God is and his wisdom's above ours, I just say this, let God lead. You're not gonna have a better leader for your life. Let God lead. Let him take over, celebrate what he's doing, celebrate his plan, his protection, and his provision. We just sang about the names of God. We, We... We thank God. He is Jehovah Shalom. And what does he do? He brings peace. Celebrate who he is, his protection and his provision. 
and then let the goodness of the Lord travel beyond the walls of the church. Here's a couple pictures uh, from this week, and we had an outreach time at Emerald Downs, and there's a ministry that's been happening at Emerald Downs that's significant. And God's doing ministry everywhere. You might not know this, but there's over 350 people who live on the campus of Emerald Downs. 350 people live there. There's over 700 horses. So what happens during the week at Emerald Downs? Uh, Andre Sims, I'm thankful for his leadership, partnership. Uh, Andre's been coming to Grace, and he ministers there. And then anyone can join him. You say, well, what's happening? There's food, there's clothes there. Uh, we brought Bibles. Why did we bring Bibles? Because many people there, their primary language is Spanish, and they didn't have Bibles. And so we had Bibles, and we brought Bibles this week, dozens of Bibles. Why do we bring so many Bibles? Because in the last couple months, dozens of people have put their trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And different people have been grace, have been serving there for years. I, I shared and someone said, oh, I used to serve there 10 years ago. It, it's another opportunity. And when you want people to flourish, you care for their souls. And, and here's what I hope as a church is that we're always giving opportunities and support for you to bless the community. You can do it in your own drive, Uber driver. You can do it there. As a church, you know, as, as we walk through different situations, there's Emerald Downs. Human trafficking. A lot of people are talking about human trafficking. We have people in this room who are serving, and you can serve in that area of human trafficking. Uh, what else? Drive through prayer every week. It's a way you can get involved. Bless people. Help them flourish. We want to help people flourish. Then we have the Compassion Clinic. That's meeting physical needs. There's uh, lots of you know doctors, dentists, physical therapists, and, and beyond. Life groups. One part of life groups is going out and serving. So many life group projects that you do together in neighborhoods that you find serving in warehouses. Uh, there's a list that so many things that you can do and just prayerfully say, God, how do you want me to bless and flourish, help other people grow deep in their walk with you? And this is what it comes down to in all those. And I could keep naming more examples. Main event was incredible. So many of you served there. There's, we want to continue to encourage, empower, give you opportunities. And then this is the key. You go to where people are, you build relationships, and then you lead them to God. Right? Does that make sense? Go to where people are, build relationships, love people humbly, and then tell them about God. Go to where people are. Are you doing that? Are you going to where people are? Are you building relationships? Are you loving people well? Are you leading people to God? That's how the community flourishes. And we can all step into that. God wants to empower us. Let's see how this psalm ends because there's one more major challenge when it comes to hope. Verse 12, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age they will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. Can we talk about aging for a minute? It says in this verse right here, you read it with me, verse 14, old age. There's no number in the Hebrew right there. So I can't tell you exactly what number old age is, but I think we can all relate to aging. Someone says aging is not for wimps. How can you flourish and be aging at the same time? The challenge in aging is not easy. When you start to lose some physical abilities or you don't feel like as sharp or quick uh, as you used to be, you know what else happens with aging? You take care of your parents. Has anyone taken care of their parents? What an amazing ministry. Oh, keep up the good work. Like that, that is the hands and feet of Jesus. Right there, that's, that's scripture. So taking care of parents as they're aging and then aging and going through, gotta go to the doctor, gotta change the way I eat, gotta be intentional with this, you know, maybe a procedure here. Like there's, there's a lot to aging and sometimes you can get discouraged or feel defeated with aging, right? And you even wonder, can I still be flourishing 
as I'm aging? What about the last third of my life? Like, will that be, can that be vibrant? And that's what the psalmist is talking about right here. Flourish like a palm tree, solid. Cedar of Lebanon, 20, 120 feet high, 30 feet circumference. And when you think about that upright, the picture here is aging while being secure, fresh, fruitful, vitality, growth, solid, even when the world is changing, even when the circumstances are difficult, even when part of your body is not working like you want it to, how do you respond? I talked to a senior this last week, and, and she said, I just focus on what's still working. And I, I'm thankful for that. My, my 10 toes are having a good day today. There's 10 reasons to give thanks right there. That's working well. Uh, see, how you approach things is very significant. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. And when you think about the scripture, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. What does that mean? We are in a temporary tent, our bodies. These are not our permanent bodies. And one day there'll be a homecoming and we'll be finished with these bodies. Yet inwardly, in the middle of this process, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but we fix our eyes on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We have an eternal hope that's so much greater than the challenges that we face during the day. We will be flourishing for eternity because of Jesus Christ. So we keep this perspective, and I think it's really important at every age and stage to stay active. Would you agree? Staying active is really important as you age. Now, there's some parts of staying active, like my grandmother always enjoyed crossword puzzles. That's a good thing, right? Going for a walk is a good thing. If you like to go to the ocean, go to the ocean. Stay active in that way. When I say stay active, I'm talking about spiritually staying active in addition to those things. Those things are wonderful, but spiritually, how do you stay active? The word in the Bible is devoted, and you see in the community of faith in Acts chapter two, the early church, multicultural, multi-generational, what's the key? Stay active in your faith, stay devoted. Well, what does that really look like? I'm gonna make this as simple and clear as I can. We have bodies, and I'm at different parts of the body tie into staying active spiritually. We have knees, it's important spiritually, you don't always physically get on your knees, but I'm using knees as a picture of praying. Because when you think about getting on your knees, it's a humbling time of prayer. So the knees remind us to keep praying. You can pray at every age and stage of life. Uh, cultivate a deep foundation and a bold declaration at every age and stage in life. I meant to introduce it by saying that. Now, what else? Well, your heart. I'm talking about love and connecting with other people and that close-knit community, those relationships, friends, family, be intentional to build up those relationships. The heart is connected to the love for one another. What else? Hands. Hands are tied to serving. You can always serve in different ways. There are so many ways to serve. You just find one way that you can serve. So praying really connected with other people, not isolated. Hands that serve. You can keep doing these things at every age and stage of life. And I wanna add, if you start to skip some of these things, the flourishing doesn't look the same. There's two more I wanna highlight. The, the next one is your mouth. Look at Psalm 89, verses one and two. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Declare is the key word. That's why God's given us a mouth to, to share it. Sometimes it's a whisper, sometimes it's louder. But with your mouth, this is an incredible gift, an incredible gift to be able to share with other people. Now, I've heard a lot of seniors say, you know, the older I get, the less I care about what people think. Well, that's good in a way, because that might free you up to share some things. You can declare God's goodness and what he's done, who he is, and your story. You just continue to share that the rest of your life. You might have grandkids that are listening so much 
more closely than you realize. And when you share that with them, that's a seed that's gonna remain in them for all their years and the decades to come. So your mouth is so powerful. The last one's your mind. Psalm 1, verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And this is for the person who's trusting God's word, who's meditating on God's word. God's word renews our mind. And again, what's the picture? When you have God's word in you, there is fruit. The leaves do not wither. And it's so important to, to receive that and then uh, to live this out. What did I just say? Staying active. Knees are linked to praying, praying. Hands are linked to serving. A heart is linked to connecting in those relationships. A mouth for declaring your story and the goodness of God. In a mind that's being renewed through scripture. And no one can take those away. This is what you cultivate. This is an inward renewal. Your inner man or inner woman can be growing, thriving, soaring in every situation because God's hope is greater than our challenges. It comes down to abiding with Jesus. That's where it starts. And as we abide with Jesus, we respond with choices in what we cultivate. And the Bible, as you read Psalm 92, it's just so clear. It's just so clear. Flourishing what is really flourishing for your soul? And then you can do that in every age and stage, those rhythms, those rhythms. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are greater than the challenges we face. And Jesus, you said it so clear. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you've come to bring in abundance. We know that doesn't mean a big bank account, but that abundance is our walk with you, our closeness with you. God, I pray today for every man and woman here, you would renew on the inside. You would renew the inner man and the inner woman today, God. God, I pray that our, our choices, what we cultivate during the week would shift and we would give you access. We give you access, God, to lead us. We trust you, Holy Spirit. We pray in your name, God.